We are learning about the elementary principles as they are laid out in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. And at the moment, we are on the point that is laying on of hands. We looked in our first lesson about laying on of hands, how that the real meaning of that is fellowship, it's approval, uh, embrace, support. But there is also this idea of the Holy Spirit, and I think it's important to talk about it so that we understand, well, what does the Bible teach about that, and how is that a specific kind of laying on of hands, separate from the basic principle laying on of hands. They're different things, and I think it's important to establish that because, uh, you know, a failure to do so, let's say that you, you think that laying on of hands only refers to the Holy Spirit. Well, uh, if you do, then it can't be one of the first principles because, you know, the laying on of hands to transmit the Holy Spirit only belong to the apostles and they're gone, which does violence to Hebrews 6. That's not right. Hebrews 6 is talking about the kind of laying on of hands that 1 Timothy 5 is talking about. Lay not hands hastily. Do not partake in other sins. Keep yourself pure. Which is a first principle. But let's talk about the Holy Spirit then and establish what that means and make that clear in the mind as well so that we understand the distinction between them. But again, Hebrews 6 is very useful because it gives us a list of the uh, what people call first principles. And it's a list that I never hear anybody use, and I don't know why, other than misunderstandings about what it says. But it is the real list of the elementary doctrine of Christ. These are the actual first principle lessons, and they should be. Let's leave the elementary doctrine of Christ to go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, faith toward God, instruction about baptism, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Now we're thankful that God has permitted us to assemble in his name and to teach about such matters. But remember the list is repentance from dead works, faith towards God, instruction about baptism. I know your translation says washings. That's because they don't like the word underneath it, which is baptism. That's not what their churches, and more importantly, their customers, do. But it is an elementary doctrine of Christ. Laying on of hands is the other thing. Resurrection from the dead, eternal judgment. These are the first principles of the doctrine of Jesus. Now, today we're focused on instruction about baptism and laying on of hands because we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Well, the first thing to note is that it existed. There was a time when the Holy Spirit was, a, was something of a baptism that fell upon people. And this happened in the New Testament at the hands of apostles. You can see in Acts chapter 8, let us begin this idea, in verses 14 down through 17, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So Samaria has heard the word and has accepted it, meaning people there are Christians. But now the apostles in Jerusalem hear of this and they send Peter and John. Why? To pray for them that they might receive the Spirit. And we know he had not yet fallen on any of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. There's a difference between being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and having the apostles lay their hands on you. Then they lay their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. That's what happened. Everybody obeyed the gospel. Everybody was baptized in the name of Jesus, which we'll get to visit a little bit more here shortly. But only some, as we say, uh, had the Holy Spirit, and that was the apostles. So nobody in Samaria had, had had the Spirit because the apostles hadn't been to Samaria. 
Now you find as well in the 18th verse, a man there named Simon saw the spirit was given by means of the laying on of the apostles' hands. So he offered them money, saying, Give me this power too, that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Spirit. Now, without focusing on Simon and his terrible request, the, the thing to note here in our lesson is that it's clear the only way for this to work was with the apostles laying on of hands. Simon couldn't do it. Philip, who had preached to them in the first place, couldn't do it. He wasn't an apostle. Only the apostles could do it. Paul himself did this. And in Acts 19, we read about Paul. Having laid his hands on them, the Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. So our apostle has the ability to lay hands, which is a different commentary for a different time on the, the attacks on Paul's apostleship. Here's another indicator that, yes, he is a real apostle. Only the Jerusalem apostles could lay hands and cause the Spirit to be given in Acts 8. That's very clear. But in Acts 19, Paul can lay hands and cause the Spirit to be given. He's one of the apostles. And in Romans 1, he writes to the church there, I long to see you, verse 11, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. So he wants to go to Rome to give them the spiritual gifts that you can read about in 1 Corinthians 11, 12, 13, 14. Right, that, that's the whole kind of treatise on the governance of spiritual gifts that I'm not really going to visit today. But suffice it to say, his intent was to visit them so that he could impart this. Now how many baptisms are there is the next question. <laughs> they were only baptized in the name of Jesus and then the apostles laid hands on them and then you know, now Paul's finding that they'd only been baptized in the name of Jesus. Now, and he lays hands on them. They were baptized in other names as well. What's going on? Well, that's why we ask the question, how many baptisms are there? In Acts 19, again, verses 1 through 6, let's get the whole picture. Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. He said, Into what then were you baptized? Now, it's interesting that he says then. Into what then were you baptized? That's important because then means I can draw a conclusion from what you have just said. You have just said something that is not what I expected. You didn't even hear of the Holy Spirit? Well, the reason that's interesting is because of Matthew 28, where Jesus said, Go into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's clear that this is not what they have done. And they said, Into John's baptism, which is valid, but, as Paul said, John baptized... With the baptism of repentance, yes, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. And this is absolutely correct. John said, I am not he. One comes after me, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to loose or untie. So he's, John's not wrong. People repenting is good. And being baptized with John's baptism, saying you're repentant and you're starting over, that's good. But that's not what we are instructed to do today. Today, he said to them, you know, but John's purpose was to point you to the one who is coming. That's Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. So first they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, then he laid hands and the Spirit came. Which is very similar to what we read in Acts 8, that they had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and had not had the Spirit fall on them until the apostles came to lay hands. It's the exact same sequence of events. Then we go to Ephesians chapter 4, 
this same congregation <laughs> that started with these 12 men, you know, this same congregation in Ephesus, Paul writes them a letter. They'd been baptized with John's baptism. They've now been baptized with the baptism of Christ. And they were baptized in the Holy Spirit as well. They've had three of them in the New Testament age. And Paul writes in Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6, There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to that call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, over all, through all, in all. Paul himself knows these people have been baptized no less than three times. He's the one who did it. Two of them. Though which baptism is the one baptism? How can he write to them that there's one baptism? Well, that's a reasonable question, I think. And we ought to settle it in Acts chapter 2. And then moving from there to the 10th and 11th. But Acts chapter 2, the first time this happens is when the Holy Spirit falls on the apostles. Suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's Acts 2, 4. They began to speak foreign languages, the languages of all the people who were in town for Pentecost is what it is. And it was the Holy Spirit who was giving them utterance, meaning they were saying what the Spirit had them saying. What did the Spirit have them saying? Well, among the things they said was Acts 2.38. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. It's very interesting to me that the apostles are filled with the Spirit from heaven direct. These are God's chosen emissaries, the vessels of his revelation. And the Spirit gives them utterance. And the thing they utter is, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the Holy Spirit's gift. What does the Spirit tell them to do? Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. Obtain for yourself the gift that the Holy Spirit has for you. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Which baptism do you think it is here? Is it the Holy Spirit baptism the apostles had? Or is it the baptism in the name of Jesus Christ that gives you the gift from the Spirit of salvation, forgiveness? If we go forward to Acts chapter 10, Peter speaking to Romans, Gentiles, quote-unquote, which is a terrible translation of the nations, not just the nation of Israel, but all the nations of the earth. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word and the believers who were from the circumcised, that is to say the Jewish who had come with him, were amazed because the gift of the Spirit was poured out even on these nations not just on the nation of Israel. Now what's interesting about this is that it's like what happened in Acts 2. Nobody laid hands on them. The Spirit fell on them directly from heaven. That's a sign from God. See, Peter was still talking and the Spirit fell on them. They were amazed because the Spirit was poured out on the nations. They heard them speaking foreign languages and extolling God. At which point, Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? The apostles received the Holy Spirit direct from heaven. It fell on them suddenly. That's the same thing that happened to these Romans. And just as the Spirit fell on Peter and told him to say, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins, the Spirit fell on these people, and Peter now is being told to say again, Who can forbid the water for baptizing these who have received the Spirit 
the same way we did. Water for baptizing, what does that mean? It means this, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. The baptism in water is the baptism for forgiveness of sins. It's the baptism in the name of Christ, which means it has to be the one that Jesus talked about. If it's by his authority, in his name, we're not talking about an incantation or spell, a formula of some kind. We mean in his authority, as he says. And what did he say, Matthew 18, or Matthew 28, you remember? Go forth and baptize the nations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's clear that being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ is that one baptism for forgiveness of sins in water. Now we go over to Acts 11. Peter has some explaining to do back in Jerusalem. When he gets back to Jerusalem, the, the Jews there have a little bit of a contention because, hey, you went to Romans. You're not supposed to do that as a Jewish person. And he explains to them why he did it, how God gave him a vision. And at first he himself thought, I shouldn't go. But God told him to go. And then when he got there, this happened. Acts 11, verses 15 to 18 records, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as he had on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's interesting. There's a couple of things here to note. One being, he fell on them just as he had fallen on us at the beginning, which is telling us that this sudden rush of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit falling upon them suddenly, spontaneously from the perspective of, of the people who were there, has only happened once. It happened in Acts chapter 2. The next time they saw it happen was Acts chapter 10, when it fell on the Romans. Everybody else was getting the laying on of hands. If they were getting the Spirit, it was through the apostles laying on their hands. This thing, where the Spirit falls on them spontaneously, has only happened twice now. In Acts 2 for the apostles and in Acts 10 for the Romans. The second thing to note here in Acts 11, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We read in Acts 8, uh, I'm sorry, in Acts 19, how that the Ephesians had been baptized in the name of John for repentance, not in the name, but you know, with John's teaching about baptism of repentance. And Paul said, John taught that people should believe the one coming after him, that's Jesus. Here we read, the Lord said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Spirit. You can see how that there's a natural progression there. They're not contradictory, they're complementary. If then, reasons Peter, if then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent. They had to stop complaining because it's clear that, yes, this is from God. And they glorified God, saying then to the nations also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Repentance that leads to life. And that's the end. That's the end of the lesson. The fact is, when we talk about the fundamental principles of the uh, laying on of hands and the instruction of the baptisms. These are the kinds of things we're talking about. And it's true, God has granted to us, who are all the nations of the world, forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus Christ. He gave his Holy Spirit to his chosen ones to reveal this to us, as it has been recorded in the text of Scripture, and will be with us forevermore. Today, if you have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus, the call of God is for you to obey in the same manner 
as these have done, that you should repent and that you should be baptized in the name of Christ in water for forgiveness of sins and receive the Holy Spirit's gift, which is to say the Spirit inspired all of these words. The Spirit formed all of this plan. That's the mind of God to bring about the salvation of humanity. We have water here prepared for that purpose and that reason. And we'll be glad to lay hands on you And so far as we say we'll be glad to accept what you are doing and you'll, you'll find here that you have like-minded people who are also serving God, who are also concerned about spiritual things and being right with him. If by chance you have not lived right and need the prayers of the saints as a Christian, we're glad to pray with you and for you in this regard too. There is such a thing as a repentance from dead works. There is a resurrection of the dead. And there is coming an eternal judgment for which we need to be ready. It's more important than anything in this world. If today you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, either way, please let that need be known now by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected. 